Let's do some First John chapter 5. <clears throat> Pardon me. <clears throat> so, I must apologize. We're, <clears throat> we're, we're going to... Um, this evening we have to... Well, not as bad as next week, if I'm honest. Um, we have to get into the, into the weeds just a little tonight. Next week, bring your waiters, because we're going to be tromping around in there, um, <clears throat> trying to find John's lost comma. But in... Uh, <clears throat> I'm not kidding. Um, but... Uh, but tonight, I think it, I think it'd be okay. Um, just regular boots would be all right. <clears throat> in First uh, John chapter five, there's um, John. Uh, what's the best way to describe this? Um, there are in my. You can arrive there different ways, but John has a. This particular section is um, really profound, and. Um, um, at least was tremendously helpful to me personally <clears throat> in trying to solve some questions um, that that I will uh, try and give to you, and um, we'll see if we can uh, we'll see if we can resolve those uh, together in working through this. But some really um, questions that I think are fundamental to to what we've believed, and um, particularly uh, what God uh, is going to do with you and I. Uh, so those things. Um, in order to be intellectually honest and, uh, and, and rational, 1 John 5 has the key that, that turns that lock. And so <clears throat> I, uh, um, I think you're going to have a great time tonight. This will be fun. <clears throat> 1 John chapter 5, verse 1. Whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and whoever loves the Father loves the child born of Him. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God, And observe his commandments. This is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not burdensome. Whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is the one who overcomes the world? But he who believes that Jesus is the son of God. Let's pray. Father, we're very grateful for the time we get to be together this evening. Father, we give um, we give you praise, Lord. Um, we only get to um, have that kind of fellowship um, as a result of what you have accomplished through Jesus Christ. And Father, we're, we recognize, Lord, that, that, um, that our common faith and the, 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 the bonds of fellowship and, and brotherhood that we have in Christ are all because of you. <clears throat> we're grateful, Lord, that you have um, not only brought us together, but Father, we're grateful that you've given us purpose. And um, Lord, just especially thank you for your word and for the, uh, the insight that it provides and <clears throat> for how you really have anticipated all the possible questions. Just so really thankful that, um, that we can ask the questions uh, of, your, of your word um, with, with confidence that, um, that you have addressed them and that, um, that we, can be, um, we can be rational, we can be um, honest and, uh, and, and find answers uh, for those things. Um, Father, we pray that our faith would be strengthened as a result of that investigation this evening. <clears throat> Father, may we be a, an encouragement to one another and a glory to you. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> <clears throat> John says, Whoever believes in Jesus is born of God, and whoever loves the Father loves the child born of him. <clears throat> we... Uh, we left off last week in about verse 18. <clears throat> John encapsulates that in 19 through 21 um, with the same theme that he's been writing since chapter 1. <clears throat> that is, if you love the Lord, you also... Oh dear, we're going to have to go back to chapter 1. I can see right now. If you, then you also love your neighbor, right? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That's I knew that was it. <clears throat> right? If you love the Lord then you have to love your neighbor too, because the two are inseparable. And so uh, John is quite blunt when he says in chapter 4, verse 20, if someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar. For the one who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. This commandment we have from him, that the one who loves God should love his brother also. He's going to, the first couple verses of chapter 5, continue to echo that theme. Um, because whoever loves the Father 
in verse 1, loves the child born of him. By this we know we love the children of God when we love God and observe his commandments. <clears throat> I remember I was chatting with my dad one time and, and um, uh, he, you know, dad was a funny guy and, and um, if he liked you, he liked you. And if he didn't, there wasn't much you could do about that either. And so <clears throat> he said, uh, he liked all of you, though. He really, yeah. <clears throat> but um, I remember we were chatting one day and he said, you know, I, I really, I don't really like people very much. And I said, well, you know, I, I get that. There's some people that I have some trouble getting along with, too. But he said, yeah, I just don't really, you know, it's difficult to, to uh, you know, I don't know if I want to have Bible studies with people because, you know, some people I just don't really like very much. Just don't really like them. And, you know, and he was just being honest. And and first John at the end of chapter four and well, scatter all the way through. But first uh, chapter um, five and the first couple of verses set you at liberty. Because that's OK. You don't have to like him. <clears throat> For their own sake. Now, I'm not now sometimes. This was popular. I don't know. Maybe this was just a Church of Christ thing when I grew up. But, but um, occasionally it would be circulated that, well, you have to love them, but you don't have to like them. Well, no, it doesn't work that way. You don't get to, you don't get to pick and choose. If you, if you love them, you like them too. But <clears throat> the great thing is I can love somebody not because they deserve it. Because a lot of people don't, do they? But, you know, you're free to love someone, not on the basis of what they've done or on the basis of how they've treated you, but you're free to love people because they are God's children. Because whoever loves the father loves the child born of from whether or not they individually have demonstrated anything that might warrant that affection. I'll give you an example of that. Forgive them, father, they know not what they do. These guys didn't do anything to warrant Jesus' affection. <clears throat> if anything, just the opposite, right? Mm -hmm. However, <clears throat> Jesus is free to love them, isn't he? And care about them and want the best for them. And so <clears throat> he does. And, uh, and that's expressed, obviously, in his prayer to the Lord. <clears throat> we know, in verse 2, we know that we love the children of God when we love God and observe his commandments. And this is the love of God that we keep his commandments. His commandments are not burdensome. The keeping of the whole law really does boil down to two points, right? If you want to keep all the law, you got to love the Lord and you got to love your neighbor. Okay, great. <clears throat> Simple, not easy. Well, what does it take to love my neighbor? Let me, let's make it harder. What does it take to love my neighbor perfectly? I mean, if you love the Lord perfectly and you love your neighbor perfectly, that would make you perfect, wouldn't it? I'll let you think about that for a moment. But the answer is yes. Right? If, you, if you love the Lord with a perfect love and you love your neighbor with a perfect love, then you're not going to sin against either one of them. So, you would be a perfect person. Everybody still with me? Okay. Well, that seems reasonable enough. <clears throat> All right, then. Well, that's it for tonight. Just love your Lord and love your neighbor perfectly, and you'll be all set. How does Jesus do that? Because he managed to do it, didn't he? He managed to pull it off. To love the Lord and love his neighbor and do it perfectly in every circumstance. That's no small feat. How does Jesus accomplish that? That is the big question. How does Jesus do it? I want you to think about that for a second. How does... <clears throat> now, it's really easy sometimes, and uh, most of the denominational world will jump on this bandwagon. They'll say, well, that's easy. <laughs> Jesus is the Son of God. Voila. Mm, but that creates problems. Because if you take that position, then you immediately have two issues. Okay? And one of them shows up in Hebrews. So turn back to Hebrews. <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> 
and we want Hebrews chapter 2. <clears throat> Verse 17. It says, Therefore, he had to be made like his brethren in all things, that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For since he himself was tempted in that which he has suffered, he is able to come to the aid of those who are tempted. Hmm. All right. <clears throat> so in order for Jesus to be a suitable high priest or representative, representative <clears throat> of the people, he has to be, the way Hebrews 2 describes it, he has to be made like his brethren in all things. Hebrews chapter 3. 4 and verse 15 is even more emphatic. He says here, For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses. Some of your versions have removed the double negative. So it says we have a high priest who can sympathize with our weaknesses. One who has been tempted in all things as we are yet without sin. Now that is, that is a significant statement. To say that Jesus was tempted in all things as we are is to say that Jesus had to endure the same kind of temptations that are inherent to your life in his life, right? Right. And what advantage did he take along with him? Well, if he was tempted in all things as we are, then the answer has to be none, doesn't it? So <clears throat> that means that Jesus did his time in a body just like yours, right? No inherent advantages. He doesn't get to play the Son of God card occasionally. If things get a little rough, get a little dicey, temptation's a little stronger today than usual, I'm going to have to, going to, have to use the, you know, use the... Uh, I don't know what that would be, a can of, of godly spinach or something? I'm not sure. You toss that back and then all of a sudden you can take on temptation of any sort. <clears throat> Jesus doesn't get to do that. So he has to face life, <clears throat> the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the boastful pride of life with the same toolbox that you do. Right. No advantage. <clears throat> That's important because, turn to Romans chapter 9. <clears throat> In Romans chapter 9, <clears throat> Paul asks a great question. Paul is always asking great questions. <clears throat> he says in, um, let's do verse 14. Romans chapter 9, verse 14. What shall we say then? There's no injustice with God, is there? Hmm. Is there injustice with God? Let me think about this here. Hmm. On what basis can God justly, and we'll deal with this in two, in two ways, justly judge mankind? Well, let's say <clears throat> on Judgment Day, Everybody shows up before the throne, good, bad, and ugly, right? And mankind says, Lord, listen, we try really hard to be good, but wow, that was, um, that was, that was extreme. That lust of the flesh, eyes, and the boastful pride of life, that was rough. In fact, I think if you'll, Consider, since nobody was able to complete the task, may I submit that it was impossible. Could not do. It. In fact, as evidence of its of its uh, of its of the inability to, to to accomplish that, I present the entire human race, right? Who who to a man failed. Lord, you set the bar too high. It's not fair to judge us on that standard because nobody could do that. 
Okay. Now we need to pause here just for a moment. I know this is where it gets hard because you've got to hold one thing in your mind and you've got to set that on pause. We're going to come back to that. <clears throat> but Paul answers that question two ways. One is he'll, he'll refer to the justice of God. But secondly, he says, wait, 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 wait. You're not in a position to ask that question. God is perfectly at liberty to do what he wishes with what is his own. So if the Lord wants to make something and he wants to make it impossible and then punish you for the Lord is perfectly within his rights to do that since he made all of you in the first place, right? Well, yeah. However, <clears throat> God doesn't do that. <clears throat> There's no injustice with God, is there? To which Paul answers, may it never be, in verse 14. <clears throat> and then you'll notice uh, a little further on down the passage in chapter 9, he says, da, 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 verse 19. He says, you will say to me then, why does he still find fault? For who resists his will? It's a legitimate question, isn't it? If there's no other option... How could God find fault? You know, if you've if you got three doors <clears throat> and they all lead and, and, and sin is behind every door and you choose one, well, you chose wrong. You get condemned. And Corey, he chooses another one because well, that didn't work out well for me. So, right? So Corey chooses a different one. Oh, sorry, condemnation. And Rhea, she, she chooses the third door because she knows the first two aren't right. So she chooses door number three. Oh, condemnation again. Why does he still find fault? For who resists his will? If you can't escape it, is God right? To render judgment? To find fault? In Acts 17, <clears throat> this question gets, um, it gets answered. In Acts 17 and verse 30, we read, Therefore, having overlooked the times of ignorance, God is now declaring to men that all everywhere should repent, because he has fixed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness through a man whom he has appointed, having furnished proof to all men by raising him from the dead. Now, why would Jesus be the one to judge the world? Because he was the guy who did it. I mean, <clears throat> people can make lots of excuses, right? For why they didn't do it, couldn't do it, shouldn't do it, until somebody does it. And then, all those excuses are removed, aren't they? Right, right. So, <clears throat> he's furnished proof to all men by raising Jesus from the dead of who Jesus is. But Jesus is also the only individual see, perfectly positioned to judge all the world. Because he's the one if there's no advantage. Oh, but that creates another problem for us, doesn't it? If there's no advantage, if Jesus doesn't get to play the Son of God card when things get hard, well then that does leave the responsibility firmly resting on our shoulders, doesn't it? Because we can't say, well, Lord, nobody could do it. You, you made it too hard. Because the proof is in Jesus' life, <clears throat> it could be done. Everybody with me so far? Oh, good. <clears throat> I, was at a, um, I, I was at an auto body shop. Uh, over, I, I think it's still there, it's near Boyce Lumber. And I uh, was getting a quote for something, I don't know, somebody hit something. and so. <clears throat> but they had, a, um, they had this little handy um, device on the counter. And, um, and I thought, well, that's interesting. And um, it, said, it said college entrance exam. I thought, well, I've never been to college, so I better try it out. <clears throat> so I thought, well, this looks clever. So... <clears throat> And best I can, I'll describe it for you as best I can, all right? There's a, uh, it's a, uh, you've seen this, Christensen? You know what this is? Ah, 
Okay. Shape. Okay. So it's about the shape of a toothpaste, uh, like a, a box that a toothpaste tube would come in. Okay. It's about roughly that shape. And, uh, <clears throat> and it's uh, uh, wooden on the bottom. It's hollow inside and it's got transparent plastic um, on the, on the, on the three large edges, okay? On the two ends, <clears throat> there are two, um, one on prism. I lost you with prism, didn't I? I said somebody went, oh. all right. <clears throat> and so inside, on a little track between the two ends, are two ball bearings. And the goal is to balance it carefully enough that one ball bearing goes to one side and the other to its side. And it's very tricky to do. You've got to be very talented to have a, a, a very calm hand. Abram, I don't know if you could do it. You, it would be close. I, we, should, we should try it. Um, <clears throat> you don't think so? <clears throat> but you've got, to be, you've got to be very precise because, and I tried it several times, and I, ah, you know, and you, you just get it. It's very challenging. It's very challenging. They try and balance it. So I kind of misled you a little bit. <clears throat> but everybody tries to balance it. Because that's the obvious way to solve the problem, isn't it? You've got to balance it right so that one goes on either side. Well, that's crazy. <clears throat> but what's worse? Trying to get ball bearings to go in different directions or try to love the Lord and love your neighbor by keeping the law. You can't reach that result that way. Keeping the law doesn't produce a people <clears throat> who love the Lord and love their neighbor. Keeping the law is never supposed to produce that. So <clears throat> you, can, you can try all you want to, and you can get your micrometer out, and you, know, you can make sure that... The, <clears throat> it ain't going to work. But if you address the problem a different way, it'll, it's easy. Like Tom said, you spin it. And the centrifugal force takes the two ball bearings in opposite directions, <clears throat> and you look like a genius, and you may go to college now. I think actually that would weed out a lot of the problems at the U of M if they would just use that as the real entrance exam. I think, I think that would solve a lot. McHenry, is that, is that true? Is that accurate? I, I think maybe not. <clears throat> but I think that would be a help. <clears throat> the problem is you can't solve the problem the wrong way. <clears throat> so when people are trying to figure out, how do I live like Jesus? Well, <clears throat> I can't lie, I can't steal, I can't... Sooner or later, what they think they're after. If you want more on this, um, catch the end of Romans chapter 9, <clears throat> and Paul addresses that question uh, directly. It doesn't work. <clears throat> Jesus does not do it that way. <clears throat> See... Jesus is the first guy to address the problem differently. See, because here's, <clears throat> here's where we're left. Re excuse me. Whatever Jesus did, you could do. Mm. <clears throat> if you could do it, then it was available to you. But the fleshly nature of mankind <clears throat> kind of lends itself to the application of law to solve this problem. And so everybody, everybody tries to solve it that way, by keeping the law. What was it that made Jesus righteous? You know, when I ask that question most of the time, <clears throat> the response I almost get uniformly is, he never sinned. That's not correct. You say, well, why was Jesus righteous? <clears throat> he never sinned. No. Nope. That's true, Jesus never sinned, but that's not what made him righteous. The law can make nothing perfect. Right? No one, nothing is justified by the law. Then it can't justify Jesus either. So how is Jesus shown to be righteous? 
It's not on the basis of the law. About the priests, <clears throat> they were trying to get him on, the, on a Sabbath day violation, right? Felony charge of Sabbath violation. <clears throat> and uh, I said, why does, you know, why do you do this? On the, why did you do that? <clears throat> and Jesus said, really? He said, uh, what, what's written about the priests? He said, don't they every Sabbath break the Sabbath? And he said, sacrifices on the Sabbath, just like every other day. So when Jesus said, haven't you read? Anytime Jesus started a conversation with, haven't you read? Somebody was in trouble. <clears throat> Somebody was about to get schooled. And so <clears throat> he said, haven't you read that the priests and they offer the sacrifices? They were innocent, right? Yeah. Implying that when he broke it, doing good by healing on the Sabbath. <clears throat> Romans chapter 3 at the end <clears throat> brings this out. We don't have time to talk about it in detail. <clears throat> but the demonstration of Jesus' righteousness is not his keeping of the law. It is what he accomplished by faith. Now that shouldn't be a surprise to any of you. <clears throat> because how did all of the Old Testament approved how did they receive that status? They gained approval on the basis of their faith. So all of Hebrews 11 is a discussion of how these guys with faith accomplished great things. Things that, were, that other people could not accomplish, right? I mean, I don't know if you've tried building an ark that size, but not likely that you're going to get it done especially not the help of Mr. DeWalt. <clears throat> but they accomplished things. They put foreign armies to flight. They shut the mouths of lions. They escaped the edge of the sword, right? Women received back their dead. I mean, there's a whole list of things <clears throat> that they did by faith that did they really do? We should touch on just for a moment <clears throat> the relationship between faith and action and miracle. And I know we're covering an awful lot of ground tonight, but <clears throat> I, I really felt like this was the best way to try and, and reach where John wants, to, wants us to go. <clears throat> of all the miracles you can think of in the Bible, okay, so think of one. Everybody got their miracle? Okay, if you don't, just elbow the guy next to you. He's got a miracle. He can share his miracle, okay? <clears throat> Everybody got their miracle? All right. In almost every case, I can't think of an exception to this off the top of my head. Maybe you guys will find one. <clears throat> In almost every case, there is, uh, you know, someone's faith is involved. They had to do something. Now, the, what they did was not particularly impressive. They, they did something menial. Okay. So, Feeding 5,000 people, 5,000 men plus women and children. <clears throat> Some kid shows up with his Spider-Man lunchbox and says, I've got these loaves and fish. Lord, you can have them. <clears throat> okay, good example. What did he do that was miraculous? Nothing. All he said was, here's my tuna sandwich. That's not miraculous, is it? Then is that miraculous? Certainly not. <clears throat> I mean, the fact that he still had tuna sandwiches left, that might be a miracle. But <clears throat> the fact that he just gave them to the Lord, that's not a miracle. What's the Lord do? The Lord takes a menial action when it's done with faith. And then God's the one who does the miracle. In your miracle, was there any exception to that? Did I miss one? And that's never miraculous. But when their action is joined with faith, then God is the one who performs the miracle. That happens over and over and over and over again. I mean, <clears throat> that's what happened when you became a Christian, wasn't it? I mean, your faith, coupled with your action, and, you know, just going under the water and coming back out, that is not a miracle. People do that all the time. <clears throat> but in that case, where faith is joined to action, what happens? God acts. And something miraculous takes place. Not because of what you did, 
but because of what God did. <clears throat> See, faith gives you a greater return for your efforts. <clears throat> Jesus did something tremendous, but he did it with faith. He lived a perfect life. He loved the Lord and he loved his neighbor perfectly. The result was <clears throat> he was righteous, but he also didn't sin. The, the avoiding of sin is the byproduct. It's not the means by which you achieve it. Avoiding sin is just what happens when you love your neighbor and you love the Lord. <clears throat> when Jesus, by faith, is righteous, those things happened automatically. Any questions so far? Still with me? Okay. <clears throat> Very good. So, <clears throat> verse 4, 1 John chapter 5, verse 4, <clears throat> whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Whatever is born of God overcomes the world. Hmm. Well, <clears throat> that's a pretty significant statement all by itself. Whatever is born of God <clears throat> overcomes the world. Jesus overcame the world, didn't he? This is not a trick question. Yes, he did. <clears throat> okay. Was he born of God? Yes, he was. All right. So Jesus is born of God. He overcomes the world. Fantastic. Wait a minute. If Jesus can spin that thing, can I spin that thing? Now, I can't, I can't balance it, but could I spin it? See, if it worked for him, well, the same thing should work for me, right? I mean, if that's the way to do it, and Jesus had, has inaugurated for us this way, if that's the way to get it done, well, then Craig could do it, right? Can you spin it, Craig? Oh, okay, great. Joseph, can you? Joseph could do it, right? Sure. Tom could, Tom could spin. <clears throat> See the point? Jesus has explained this is, how, this is how it works. This is how you accomplish it. This is the victory <clears throat> that has overcome the world. Well, when did it overcome the world? In Jesus. What then did Jesus believe? Now, I know this is going to shock you. This is going to, you better hold on to your socks because this is, why this is going to blow them right off. Ted, especially you. Your socks looked a little loose tonight, and I, <clears throat> this might just, the, yeah, watch out, Edwin. You could be hit by a. <laughs> Jesus believes that he's born of God, that he is the Son of God. Do you know that's something that is not really included in the Old Testament? I know, you guys, that doesn't sound particularly significant or profound to you because you hear that all the time. Jesus is the Son of God. Yeah, I know that. I'm a Son of God. Yep, I know. So are you. Me too. Everybody's a Son of God, right? We're all sons of God, Galatians says, through faith in Christ Jesus. Well, that's great. So we're all sons of God. But, man, that is a huge a huge development. That wasn't available in the Old Testament. Because it couldn't be. Do you remember how in John chapter 3, <clears throat> Jesus is explaining to Nicodemus, and he said, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. And that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Well, how can you be born of God if you're just flesh? And the opportunity for that doesn't come until the new covenant. So those guys <clears throat> in the old, once they became a slave of sin, stuck with it. Stuck with it. They could never call themselves legitimately children of God because they weren't born of spirit. They were only born of flesh. Do you realize how that's different for you? 
You're not born of flesh. Well, you were. But that's not what defines you now. You were born of spirit. That makes you a legitimate son of God. And you can spin it. Well, what if by faith we do some menial tasks, like renewing our minds, like setting our, our hearts and thoughts on things above rather than things on the earth? What if we, <clears throat> what if we do our part to behold the glory of God? Now, that's not a miraculous thing, is it? But when coupled with faith, the results are so that <clears throat> the transformation process, what changes in us, is bigger than what we could have effected because God works with us and He's the one who supplies the real power. Th this section in 1 John 5, whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And then He makes it, He makes it, uh, he restates what he put in, ver in verse 1. Whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. Whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And then he re-emphasizes who is the one who overcomes the world. He who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. Well, that's you, isn't it? It's only reasonable to believe that you would overcome the world. I mean, why wouldn't you? You're not a flesh anymore. You're under the jurisdiction of spirit. You've been born of spirit. You're born of God. And whatever is born of God overcomes the world. That's just the way it works. I mean, you can't hardly mess that up. If you're born of God, you overcome the world. But the challenge is adding faith to those tasks that produce miraculous results. Jesus didn't do it by keeping the law. He didn't do it by getting up earlier than everybody else. He didn't do it by staying up later than everybody else. He didn't do it by working harder than everybody else or keeping more lists or daily to do things. Right? Jesus does it on the basis of faith. And if we're going to accomplish it, it's going to be on the same basis. So the scripture might be proved that um, you are to be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Comments, questions tonight? Tim? I was say uh, how, how profound Christianity really is and how, how powerful it is. Um, only rightly so because God is God and God is all powerful. He would, he would create a system of, of belief Level, yeah, that, that we would grow up into the into the maturity that belongs to Christ. Yeah, good. Um, you know, it's not about trying harder; it's about believing more. And when it comes to Christianity, that's really where it's at. And so, the uh, the next section that we're going to work in <clears throat> here in John, First John is about why you can legitimately believe that you are a son of God. He's going to drive that. He's going to, he's going to leave. So there's no doubt in your mind that you are absolutely a son of God. And if you're a son of God, then you can spin it. Let's pray. <clears throat> Father, what a blessing it is to be together tonight. And Lord, we just thank you so much for your word that, um, that answers the hard questions, that illuminates the um, not only your plan, but also your will for us. And Father, frankly, it, it's, um, it's hard to step back far enough in order to see the scope and the, uh, just the, the breadth of what you have accomplished. Um, Father, we are so grateful for the example of faith lived out in Jesus Christ so that <clears throat> we might be emboldened um, to, to do likewise. Father, we're thankful that um, he really showed mankind um, how to come to you and, and how, to, um, how to live 
Lord, what a, what a tremendous thing that is. What a tremendous blessing that you've given to us. And Father, we pray that you'd help us to be diligent to, um, uh, to focus on our faith. That, um, that by um, being equipped in the scriptures and putting those uh, things to the test that we'd become more and more confident in the, uh, in the plan that you have for us and the partnership you have with us in, uh, in changing the inner man so that we might be able, to, uh, um, we'd be able to love perfectly just as we were perfectly loved. Ask, Lord, that you'd watch over us tonight. Uh, Father, help us as we travel about. Keep us safe, we pray. And Lord, help us to overcome the world as your sons. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat>